So first and foremost, I want to say good morning to Willow Craig's family. Good morning, good morning. Visitors and Facebook friends. I am Sister Lydia Ward. I'm the church secretary. I, I praise the Lord. I would like to say good morning to each of you on Facebook. And thank you for joining us this glorious morning. And so I want us to get started. We are running a little late, but we know God is never late. Amen. 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 So let me turn this over to the sound team as they entertain us. See you in a few minutes. Bye-bye. Amen. Let's all stand. Let's worship the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you. 
We have a new women's ministry on Rapture Saturday. And that will start on Saturday, January the 29th, first meeting at 2 p.m. If you are interested in joining us, contact Brenda Barbarino or contact the church office. Okay, now our annual business meeting was scheduled for January the 30th. However, the date has been changed. It's gonna be the first Sunday in February. I will be posting that new date on our Facebook page and also on our leadership page. So please disregard June, January 30th in the bulletin. So, so at this time I would like to present to you an opportunity to give an offering to support the work of the kingdom. And we have a, thank you, thank you, thank you. So we have a point team, they're coming forth to collect donations or place your donations in the, control, in the contribution bowl near the entrance to the sanctuary. There are other ways you can give if you're on Facebook. For those of you watching on Facebook, you can contribute on our website at www.willowpraise.org. Regular mail, Willow Praise Church, 32901 Vine Street, Willow Ridge, Ohio. Or place your offering in the church's mailbox, which is marked and located in the front of the building. So, let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you can satisfy our every desire and need. Your words say that we should give honor to you with the first fruits of our wealth. Accept our tithes and offerings as a gift of worship to you. Multiply what we give for the effective growth of our kingdom. May Christ dwell in the hearts through faith so that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. May we be filled with all the fullness of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 And I want to say thank you to each and every one of you that walked and came into the sanctuary today and for those of you on Facebook Live. Amen. Amen. And now, Pastor Gary. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Praise God. So I just want to thank Pastor Gary for trying to beat the storm tonight, <laughs> which Sister Lydia says is not going to happen here. <laughs> a faith statement, I think. <laughs> All right, praise God. So we talked today about connecting, connecting. Oh, no, you know, I don't know where y'all are at, in the, um, but I feel like we are on, we are right now living in a sweet spot for the church. We are living in a time right now that could be the church's greatest hour. We're living in a time right now where it could be the church's greatest hour. Where the kingdom is expanded and signs and wonders start busting out all over the place. That sister so-and-so who always sat quietly in the corner all of a sudden is being used to lay hands on the sick and then recover. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Yeah. Or brother so-and-so, who the, everybody thought he didn't have any potential, nothing going to happen with him. All of a sudden, he's being used and people are getting saved and born again at Walmart in the automotive section. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that. You know what? People need the gospel. Right now, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And you know what? We need to connect. We need to connect. We need to gain a new vision. There have been a lot of people come through this church over the years. And you know what? God is right now pulling on their rope. Pulling them back in. If you're on Facebook Live and you're watching this, you need to be here. You need to be here. I know some people can't be here. Okay? I get it. No condemnation right now. I'm just saying, connect. Connect. Now is the time to connect. Now is the time to connect. Now is the time. 
I'm going to speak to you today about connection, as I already said. So connecting to God and connecting to each other. Amen. So this is a continuation of what Pastor Larry's been talking about, about re returning to our first love. So, so first of all, why, why would, um, <laughs> read my own typing. So first, why would love make worship a priority in this life? We're going to talk about worship to begin with. I would love make worship a priority. So what is worship? Do you know worship, one of the meanings of worship in the original language means to kiss towards. Worship, to kiss. So true worship involves my love. See, when I realize just how much that I'm loved by God, when I get a revelation of just how much he loves Gary, Talk about me for a minute. We can talk about you for a minute. But when I realize how much he loves me, how much he gave, and how much he provided, and all the stuff that I've avoided in my lifetime, that I know about, stuff I don't know about, you know what happens? I begin to love God more and more. When I realize that all the stuff that I've been forgiven of, that he can hold against me, but instead, he nailed it to Jesus on the cross. I begin to feel this overwhelming amount of love in my heart. And I realize that, you know what? I want to worship. I want to connect with him. You see, God is not out here trying to get you. I hope you're not here today because you thought, well, if I don't go to church, you know, God's going to get me. Yeah, he wants to get you, but not in that way. He's not a gangster. All right? God wants to pull you. He wants to pull you, tug on your heart, bring you in back to it, and be connected with him. He wants to have relationship with each of us. Worship means, one of the words for, one of the dominant words for worship means to kiss towards. True worship involves my love. Otherwise, it's just a powerful religious exercise. If when we gather together here and when we worship on a Sunday morning, if all we're doing is just singing, singing, we don't hear the sang. <laughs> and what are we doing? We just sang. But you know what we're here to do when we sing is we're here to worship him. What does the scripture say that he does when we begin to praise him and worship him? What happens? Yeah, he hears those. And it blesses his heart. And you know what he does? He inhabits the praises of his people. So it means stuff starts happening. He begins to inhabit. Let me ask you, have you given God something to inhabit lately? I'm talking about singing. Singing. I'm talking about, have you really worshipped God? Have you really said, Lord Jesus, I love you. <clears throat> I love you, Lord. I don't even know why I started with you. That motion right there. <clears throat> I love Papa from Cleveland Browns. Man, I was mad they didn't make the playoffs. <laughs> Talk about something manly for a minute. <laughs> the Bengals won. Don't know that. <laughs> but, you know, but Lord, I love you. You've done so much for me, Father. You say, he ain't done so much for me. Well, then you don't know what he's done. He bankrupted heaven for you. When Jesus came, his only son, he, that's all he, that, that's, he, he gave his best. Here he extended, he extended Jesus. He loves you. Daniel Amstad is a worship leader, and he said, worship is a response to God's grace. What he's already done for me. What we need to do is think about, Lord God, what have you, what have you done for me? What does the word say you've done? You've saved me. You've delivered me. You've provided all that I have need of, Lord God. We're going to go through that litany that we've done before. But have you ever wondered why we sing before we, we get church at all? I remember when I was 20 years old, I was asking somebody at the church one time, why do we even sing? I was questioning like everything. Not in a bad way, but in a good way. Well, you got to ask, you know, why do we even sing? At the time, you know, we had an organist. 
and we sang songs out of a book. I'm like, why do we even sing? Why do we even do this, man? <laughs> why do we sing first and not the message? Why do we do that? Why? Because we got to fill space. You know, pastors up there during the week, he's thinking, you know, we got to get at least an hour and a half out of this thing. <laughs> and if I think, if I'm talking for an hour and a half, people are going to go to sleep. You know, what happened to the Apostle Paul? You know that in the that book of Acts? Where Apostle Paul was long-winded, you know. And he's preached so long, somebody fell out the window. He fell asleep and fell out the window and died. That starts a revival, wouldn't it? <laughs> People dying on your, in your service. So anyway, it happened to him. So if something happens in Sunday morning with, with me or Pastor Ray, hey, it happened to the Apostle Paul. Go to sleep. Don't nobody die or anything. Go to sleep if you want. But anyway, why do we sing? It may seem so unnecessary to some who just want to come and hear the pastor. But you know what? Worship is so critical. It's so important. It's not only important in the aspect of, my, you know, God is worthy. And I think about it. God is so worthy of my praise and worship. But it shouldn't be something I just do on a Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Right? But also, worship, praise and worship is so impactful to me when I praise and I worship Him. And I want to try to convince you of that today. So when I ask the question, why love makes a work, why does love make worship a priority? Love is just a natural expression of my love for God that I would worship Him. Kissed, kiss towards Him. To kiss towards my Father. Amen. And some of you guys out there, you may be like, oh, this sounds like a girl message. You got kissing going on. And a lot of references to love. But I got to tell you something. Um, the Father loves you. He loves you so much, and He's pulling on your heart, and He wants to connect with you here this morning. All right, so I questioned about that, about why do we even sing and stuff. Well, I was told, well, we just do it that way. It's always, it's always been. We, know, we always love that response when you get that. Why do we sing? Why do we come together? Well, first of all, this is called the house of worship. House of worship, right? We kiss towards the lover of our soul. We honor him. We magnify him. We love on him. When you're going through something difficult... When I'm going through something difficult, if I begin to magnify the Lord and just begin to worship and praise Him, you know what happens to me? Is that my God becomes bigger and bigger and bigger to me. It's like God, well, God didn't grow any in actuality. But in my heart and in my, with my faith, He has become big enough to handle my problem. My faith begins to grow. And my problem doesn't look like so much. You know, this guy right here looks a little small now. But when he looks at the enormity of creation, when he looks at the enormity of God, and he finally takes that gaze and he looks at God, and then he looks at his problem, suddenly his problem doesn't seem like that big of a deal. Suddenly his problem doesn't seem like something that God can't take care of. So we love on him. For true worship involves my love. It involves my heart. So I believe what happens is love happens and connection happens and then that worship begins to take place. Have you ever been in a worship setting and you sang a song a hundred times and then all of a sudden you sing it one Sunday and then it's like you get all emotional all of a sudden? All of a sudden it just hits you different? Or all of a sudden you get happy over it? Maybe I'm the only one. Anybody? Yeah. Worship opens you up to receive from God. When I begin to worship God, it opens up my heart to be able to receive. Because I can tell you, some Sundays, I'll talk about you for a minute because I don't want to embarrass myself. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll talk about me. <laughs> But I'm going to say, some Sundays when I leave the house, you know, I didn't come, I didn't float to the car. 
I didn't walk to the car speaking in tongues. You know, I, I didn't come here in the car quoting every scripture and, you know, whatever. I didn't heal four people on the way. You know, what happens lots of times when we're on our way to church is that we're, we're making it and we're, we're kind of barely making it. And then just before we leave, we're like, would you just shut up and get in the car? We're going to be late. We've got to go to church. Right? say this and I'll get heat later, but I told my wife that I have three things that have happened in my that, that I do in my life now. I sleep, I work, and I wait. Yeah. Amen. Amen. We get yeah. that good. Hey, I'm in trouble. So worship opens you up to receive from God. If I'll take my focus off of me and I'll begin to focus on God and connect with him. Stuff can start happening. I can now begin to receive from God. But also, worship is warfare. You may be singing something and you may get a little two step going on or whatever, or you may feel such joy in your heart, you may think not much is going on, but worship is warfare. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Praise and worship destroys chains, it breaks chains. You're going through depression. You're going through a lot of anxiety. You need to take the focus off of yourself, Gary. <laughs> Speak to myself. I need to take the focus off of myself and get my focus upon the Lord. Amen. And begin to worship Him and love on Him. And you know what happens? I don't know about you all, but I can change like this. I wish I could click better. I can change like that. Now, I'm going to tell you, just a few days ago, I was feeling all encouraged, and I was, stuff was going well, and I, I spent some time with the Lord, and then I heard a negative report about something else. And you know what? In a moment's notice, I just felt like I didn't want to do anything. You ever been there? Yeah. All of a sudden, you just get discouraged. Yeah. And I'm like, wait a minute. Five minutes ago, I caught it. I caught it. Five minutes ago, I was encouraged and I was just so happy in the Jesus and I had spent time with the Lord and then I hear a negative report and now I'm like, it's all hopeless. What are we doing this for? Uh, all right, take this to the take this to the inverse or the opposite. As we take our problems to the Lord, we begin to worship and magnify him. Our whole perspective can change. And not only that, not only just our perspective, but this but the spirit inside of you begins to get stirred up. And you begin to you begin to see things happen differently in your life. Things happen. Praise and worship destroys chains. God inhabits the praises of his people. And I will tell you, worship brings expectancy, and expectancy, as I heard one man say, is the breeding ground for miracles. Do you hear what I said? Worship brings expectancy and expectancy. Is the breeding ground for miracles. Love, connection, worship. Are you connected to Jesus? Well, if you're born again, you are connected to Jesus. Amen. Right? If you're born again, you're connected to Jesus. God's overwhelming desire was for you. He wasn't thinking, wow, I can really use that person. They're a really good artist. I can use them for the kingdom. I need them for this, that, and the other thing. Or he wasn't looking at him and saying, you know, I can really use them because they're a good singer. <laughs> no, it wasn't about that. He came to you and he said, I love you. I want you. I want you. Not for what you can bring, but just because I love you. God's overwhelming desire was for you. Not what you can do for him, not whatever his will is for your life. God's overwhelming desire was to connect you or connect with you, and he did just that. 1 Corinthians 6 17 is my next slide, which I know will be pretty slow. I'm going to pick it up. It says here it says, uh, But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Have you been joined to the Lord? Are you born again? Your spirit and God's spirit have become one. On the inside of you. You are connected. 
You are connected. Your spirit and the Holy Spirit are one. And that word one, it actually means one to the exclusion of another. You can't, it's not saying words that are going in parallel. No, it means one. One. You're one spirit with God. So when you first believed, God came in. He set up residence on the inside of you, and now you are his abode. Amen. You are his abode. You can be connected, but yet not connect. You can be connected, but yet not engage. <laughs> Let's talk about marriage for a minute. Oh, I don't want to go there, but it's the best example. <laughs> right? In marriage, you're connected to your spouse. You're in marriage relationship. You're in a covenant relationship. You're one. Amen. In the eyes of God, right? But you can be connected, but yet not connect. You see what I'm saying? Here's the thing. God says he's married to you. He loves you unconditionally. And he wants to engage. See, the, the thing is, is that God is always engaging. He's always speaking. He's always tugging our hearts. And he's patiently waiting for us to respond to those beckonings, to those calls of love. So, I need to rekindle the connection. Amen. And now the romance begins. I wish I had some really snazzy music right there. The romance. God is always speaking. He's always drawing. He's always beckoning. He's like that guy at work that was always sending this girl flowers. Good grief. <laughs> this guy is just over the top. You know what? God is over the top about you. He's got your picture on his refrigerator. It's in the Greek somewhere, I'm pretty sure. God is beckoning you. God is loving you. He's not ridiculing you. He's not criticizing you. He's not putting you down and saying, well, you know, you could have you prayed four hours today instead of three. You could have read your Bible last night, but you didn't. You watched whatever. Football. God is always on. He's always speaking. So 1 Corinthians 12, 2, it says, Ye know, you got that one? Ye know that ye were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Jesus, or, this, or God is always speaking. He's always wanting to communicate with us. He's always communicating. And I love this portion of scripture in 1 Corinthians 12, 2. Where it's talking about, he's talking about, you know that you were Gentiles. He's talking to the Corinthian church because they were involved with idols. And Paul called them dumb idols. That doesn't mean they weren't intelligent. Okay? It just means they didn't speak. They weren't real gods. They didn't speak. And I love it how the Paul, what he does, he talks about the Corinthian church being carried away by dumb idols in their past. Meaning they're unwilling and unable to speak. Those idols were. But then he goes into the gifts of the Spirit and how God speaks to his church. See, God is not silent. That's true. God is not silent. He's always speaking. And he's always speaking to you. Amen. Scripture says, be still and know that I am God. we got to find that place. Years ago, I preached a message called Stuck in Traffic. And it was a message where it's like, I feel like we're so busy in our current society and we just don't have time for God. I can say amen to that. <laughs> There's a lot going on, right? But we need to get out of traffic. We need to pull off on the curb and we need to spend some time with God. He speaks. He speaks to you. Can you hear him? Can you hear him? You know, a lot of times the voice of God sounds a lot like your voice. Because he's speaking to your heart. He's speaking to my heart. And he said, Gary, this is what you need to do. You need to go. You need to talk to your daughter. You need to say these things. You need to go there. You need to apologize. Well, that can't be God. That can't be God. Because <laughs> I'd have to swallow my pride and do that. But you know what? A lot of times his voice sounds a lot like my voice. 
because he's speaking in my heart. So when you come to the place that you've tried everything, and it seems I don't have any peace, I don't have any love, I don't have any fulfillment, I don't have any purpose, I don't have this, I don't have that. You know what? Jesus is saying, let's connect. Let's get together. Like an old friend, come get together. You ran away into a pig pen, turned your back on God, and then suddenly you feel like you feel the presence of God. Have you done that? You ever been in a place where you're kind of like doing your own thing for a long time, and then you come back like into a service or in, in, in your place and where you're at home, and then suddenly you feel the presence of God? Oh my God. Even when I'm not interested in you, even when I haven't been Mr. Perfect, you still flood me with your presence. God, how can you still love me? And he says, I'm married to you, son or daughter. God, don't look at me. I've sinned. God says, I've washed you clean. Amen. I've washed you clean. I put all of your sin on Jesus. In my eyes, you're pure. And I've used this analogy before. What is it like when you're at the store and you owe somebody money? Do you run and you don't have it in your pocket at the moment? Did you go straight up to them and say, hey, I owe you that $500. I'm sorry, I didn't give it to you yet. No, a lot of people, what they're doing is they tuck into the, the aisles. <laughs> come on, we got to get out of here. Come on, Susie, come on. Jesus' name, get out of here. Come on, we got to get away from the toy section. We all Billy, you run, we got to get out. No, but this is the thing is a lot of people think well, they, they're, you know, God's out to get them. And that like you owe him money or something. <laughs> and so they hide from God. But all the time, you don't have to hide from God. God is pulling on you. Some people think God's their problem. God's not their problem. God's the answer. He loves you. So 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 5. Look at this. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. Remember that scripture? Yeah. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. And it keeps no record of wrongs. Well, did you know that God lives by his own word? God does this. He is patient with you. His love is kind. He doesn't envy. He doesn't boast. He's not proud. He keeps no record of wrongs. He's not self-seeking with you. He loves you. Why does love make worship a priority? Because love can't help but worship. I can't help it. You see, love can't help but praise. Love can't help but worship God. Do you love him today? Do you love him today? Get reacquainted with Jesus today when you know how much he loves you. You can't help but worship. You can't help but connect. I express my love and worship and praise to God. And because I know he loves me, he will never leave me nor forsake me. I can trust him with all of my heart. Relationship requires that trust. Right? Relationship is connection. It actually is by definition, it's connection. If you say that point A has a relationship with point B, you're saying that there is a connection. There's a relationship there. So God wants that relationship with us. And you know, when I was growing up in the church, I grew up a church boy. A church boy who was definitely and desperately in need of Jesus. <laughs> I was the good kid, but all the while, you know, you could be the good kid, and inside, you are just full of dead man's bones. Yeah. You got all kinds of problems going on. And I did. Amen. So, I don't know where I was going with that. Praise God, it was a good little story. <laughs> yeah. But I was a church boy, and, uh, but see, I needed to be saved. I was born again, but I needed relationship with God. Oh, I know where I was going. <laughs> Is that... 
it was, I felt like I always received, like they say, when you need a relationship with God, you need to read your Bible, you need to give an offering, you need to be, a look. It was like I had all these things I had to do in order to please God. Okay? But all the while, God's saying, if you'll read your Bible, I'm going to set you free. If you'll read your Bible, I'm going to renew your mind and transform your life. If you worship me, you're going to be transformed. I'm going to inhabit that praise. And you know what happened to me? Things changed. It went from I have to read my Bible, I have to worship, I have to give, to I want to read my Bible. I want to worship God. I need to worship God. I need to read my Bible. I need to give. I need to give out. I'm so thankful for the Lord. Amen. So, Exodus 33, 18. It says here, Moses asked God, show me your presence. Show me your glory. And the Lord replied, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will call out my name, Yahweh, before you. Look at that. God's presence is made up of his goodness. It is his nature to be good to his children. Are, are you his today? If you're his, he wants to be, he wants you to come into his presence. You are always in his presence, right? But he wants you to come before him and worship him. He wants all that good. He wants to show you all of his goodness. Listen to this song. We're going to sing. I know, hold on. There's no music. <laughs> Where would I be? You only know. I'm glad you see through eyes of love a hopeless case, an empty place. If not for grace, where would I be? Well, you only know, and I'm glad you see through eyes of love a hopeless case, an empty place. If not for grace, amazing grace. How sweet the sound I once was lost But now I'm found A hopeless case An empty place If not for grace A hopeless case An empty place If not for grace. That is my story. I connect with that song so much because at many times I felt like the hopeless case. How many prayers I prayed, I said, Lord Jesus, you've got to be very plain with me, God, because I'm a slow learner. You know, you got to be very plain with me because you have to spell it out. You know, write it in the sky. Here you go there. <laughs> because, Lord, I want to please you. You know, if you ever speak to me about stuff, you need to be plain because I don't pick up on clues and hints and all that. you got to just tell me. <laughs> hey, Gary, I need you to do this. Okay. But I'm telling you, many times I, I connect with that song because I felt like I was a hopeless case. Or like, like my case was hopeless, my situation. Anybody else can relate to that today? Yeah, yeah. You felt like it's hopeless? <laughs> well, grace is the empowerment of God. And he brings along his grace and he empowers your situation to where now you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Amen. You are not powerless. You're a child of God. 
You know, the scriptures say, anybody know John the Baptist? It says he was one of the, he was the greatest uh, prophet in the Old Testament. Do you know what it says about the believer? Where is that? That's in Matthew 11. And again, it says about the believer, about John the Baptist, it says that the, those that are in the kingdom of God are greater than he. It says he's the greatest prophet in the Old Testament. But those that are in the kingdom are greater than he. Why is that? Because you have the spirit of the living God living on the inside of you. That changes things. So let's look at Psalms 27. Amen. So Psalms 27. Sorry, I'm still. I'm going to give you a little background on this. This is a psalm of David, a song of David. Nobody knows exactly why the psalm was written, okay? But most Bible scholars agree that this psalm was written during a time of devastating war. Where David witnessed the cruelty and savagery and horrors of war. He was going through an extremely difficult time. You could say at least, all right, to understate the situation. So if we look at this, I'm going to read down through the first six verses. It says that the Lord is my light and my salvation. I fear no one. The Lord protects my life. I am afraid of no one. When evil men attack me to devour my flesh, when my adversaries and enemies attack me, they stumble and they fall. Even when an army is deployed against me, I do not fear. Even when war is imminent, I remain confident. Verse 4. I have asked the Lord for one thing. Now look at this. He's going through all this situation. If you look at the first three verses, he keeps saying, he said, two, tw twice, I, I have no fear. Okay? That means he has occasion to be fearful. Right? Otherwise, he's not going to just say, I have no fear. I have no fear. He has occasion to fear. And he's being attacked. Men want to devour his flesh. The adversaries of enemies are attacking him. He's praying that they would stumble and fall and war is imminent, 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 about to happen. And verse 4, it says here, but this one thing I ask. And this one thing I desire. I want to live in the Lord's house all the days of my life. So I can gaze at the splendor of the Lord or the beauty of the Lord. And contemplate in his temple, or it could mean in worship, or in choir. He will surely give me shelter in the day of danger. He will hide me in his home. He will place me on an inaccessible rocky site. Now I will triumph over my enemies who surround me. I will offer sacrifices in this dwelling place and shout for joy. I will sing praises to the Lord. He's saying, this one thing I do, this one thing I desire. I want to live in your house. I want to look upon your beauty, Lord. I want to worship. Let's worship. And at that time, he said, I'm going to be out of reach of the enemy. I'm going to be out of reach. Sounds like David is in the midst of a very difficult trial. Amen? <laughs> Evil men were attacking him. War is imminent. Yes, yes, says, I remain confident. Why? Haven't you watched the news, David? Haven't you watched the news? How can you remain confident? Haven't you watched the news? Haven't you watched the 12 Spies Network on cable? The said we're all doomed. You know, haven't you been listening to what all the Christians are saying? The Christians are saying it's time for us to hunker down and just hold on until God comes back. Jesus is coming any day. It's time for you just to bunker down. What scripture is that in? Time to bunker down. What does the scripture say? Occupy until I come. You know what occupy means? To be about your daddy's business. Be about the business of the king. Haven't you seen the news? It says we're all doomed. The economy's going down. Pandemic's going on. All this stuff's going on. All these limitations. Christians under this and that. Scripture wants to ask you today, which report, report will you believe? 
when you re when you believe the report of the Lord. Yeah, but we can't deny what's happening around us. No, you can't. But you know what? You can take on the perspective of God in a situation, and you don't have to be fearful like the rest of the group at work. Amen. I'm telling you, man, when I go to work, and I don't go to work very often now, I'm actually online. But when I go to work, we get together as 15 or 18 of us. Every one of them are just talking about how scared and fearful they are about different things. And I'm like, I just don't. I mean, I, you know, I'm not. I'm not trying to be a fool, okay? I'm not going to be silly. But at the same time, I'm not fearful. In the last two years, I've lived my life waiting for this mess to end, if it can. But I'm not walking around scared. Honestly enough. And I know, listen, there's people that have passed away and things like that. Okay? So I'm not belittling those things. But what I'm saying is this. For us that remain here today, fear not. Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. How can you do the works of Jesus if you're scared to death? You can't. Can't do the works of Jesus if you're scared to death. How does David respond in this situation, this bad situation? With worship, with praise, reliance upon God, from his heart of love towards God. He said, This one thing I ask, I desire to know you, God, to dwell with you, to behold him. You know, Psalm 18, David said, David, you know, David loved the Lord. He said, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So, so shall I be saved from mine enemies, unless there's a pandemic. Look at Sydney. Unless there's a pandemic, then it's uh, well, that's all off. You better go hide. It's in there, the original Hebrew. <laughs> no, it's not there. <laughs> no. You know the Bible's still true? Oh, yeah. Even in 2022? And I rhymed, I didn't mean to do that. So David also knew the power of praise and worship. I'm gonna be wrapping it up. 1 Samuel 16, do you remember that story? David knew the power of praise and worship when he was in a difficult situation. Remember that? Where Saul was being bothered by an evil spirit. And they said, what can I do? Well, we've got to go find somebody. Listen, if you're getting bothered by an evil spirit, you're looking for a solution. Amen. You're looking for a solution. Saul was looking for a solution. And he said, we've got to go find somebody. And the people said, hey, there's this dude up the road. And he's a really nice looking dude and he talks well and God is with him. I'm like, what does good looking and talk well have to do with anything? I don't know. <laughs> but they recognized that God was with him. And what did David do? It says in 1 Samuel 16, 23, it says, And it came to pass that when the evil spirit was upon Saul, that, God, or that David took an harp and he played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the spirit, that evil spirit, departed from him. Listen, it's not about music set, what is it? Music cures the savage soul. No, it's not what it is. It's not music therapy. No, what it is is that when we worship, David was worshiping on that heart. I guess that's how you say it. Something like this. <laughs> David was worshiping on that heart. And when he did, the presence of God inhabited his praise. And not only was David impacted, but Saul was impacted. The people around him were impacted. David had spent time worshiping God in the fields and looking over all those sheep, and he was praising and worshiping God. You remember the, time, the story about Paul and Silas, how they're in prison for preaching the gospel? Anybody? You know, they're in the prison for preaching the gospel in Acts 16. And what were they doing? Those crazy guys who were in there praying and singing hymns to God and with the other with the other prisoners. The, I mean, those those people in, who were over in prison, they're probably thinking, what a bunch of nuts. We put them in jail, they're in there singing. 
head must be drawn. No, that's not what happened, but. So what happened? They're in there singing, they're praying, they're singing and praying to God. But what happens? All of a sudden, an earthquake hit. And all their chains fell and the doors opened. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> And what happened? They had the opportunity to run out of that place. I don't know. I probably would have taken it. But Paul and Silas didn't take it. The jailer was like, making sure everybody's there because if they had left, he would be dead. And what did they do? They stayed there. And what happened? Him and all his family got saved. The jailer. Him and all his family got saved. But what's the thing here? The thing is, praise and worship is powerful. We're not talking about singing. Talk about praising God from your heart, from worshiping God. All right. Praise also silences the enemy. Psalm 8, Matthew 21. Praise silences the enemy. So if you're constantly being bombarded with negative thoughts from the enemy, you just begin praising God and it shuts him up. That's right. It shuts him up. Shut him up. Somebody say, shut him up. up. Praise. The message here today is connected. We need to connect. If you're feeling depressed or in fear, overwhelmed by the enemy, he's having a heyday with you and your family, you need to praise him. You need to worship him. The devil won't hang around with you. You'll be worshiping and praising God. He ain't going to want to hang with you. Ever have friends that just don't want to hang? You know, talk like you used to talk or walk like you used to walk? Well, the devil's like, man, you used to be pretty cool to hang with. I was having a good heyday with you, and now you're just praising God. I'm out of here. <laughs> he ain't going to hang around. So why does, love, and why does uh, love make worship a priority? Because love cannot help but worship. I'm going to wrap this up with this. Why does love make spiritual fellowship a priority? And I'm just going to tell you right now, I mean, I, I'm somebody who, sometimes I'm, I'm good at connecting with people, but sometimes I'm not. So I apologize if I haven't connected with you. Um, but I try to always connect with somebody I don't know. I don't, I said always, I guess is the wrong word. But I try to connect with people I don't know. Because I would hate for somebody to come to church and it's their first time here and nobody said hi to them. Nobody greeted them. Nobody offered to pray for them. You know, people come here desperate and if nobody reaches out, they just figure nobody cares. I know we went to a big church. I won't name the church. And uh, we went there and we went there for months. And I think we only had like one person talk to us. You went there? <laughs> I think it was you and I that were saying hey to each other. Yeah, it's just a shame, right? It is a shame. Because, listen, many people that are a part of the church, they think that it's the pastor's job to do all that stuff. If you're on staff, you're getting paid. That's what you get paid for. Be nice to everybody. Go pray with them. We're the body of Christ. We know you have a job to do here. You have a job to do here. The Bible says that the gates of hell, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church is you. But the church is also me. And the church is that guy. Right? It's all of us. We are all a part of the church. We're all in the same family. I understand family sometimes can be difficult to get along with. <laughs> Thus, we do Thanksgiving and Christmas once a year. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good at Thanksgiving <laughs> in my house. Praise <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> do you want extra mac and cheese? Amen. 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 So we all have a part to play in the mission for the kingdom. So connection with those, we need to connect with those that are in the family of God. Amen. So, 1 John 4, 7 through 12. I've been all over the place, Matt, sorry. She's the PowerPoint person. Here. 
Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love doesn't know God. Because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This love, not that we, this is love rather, not that we love God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. It's the job of the church. It's my job, your job, to love each other. To love each other. And love is a verb. Amen. Right. Psalm 133 says, How wonderful, how beautiful, when brothers and sisters get along. <laughs> it's a different version. I like that. <laughs> you know, you don't have to like me, but you're supposed to love me. <laughs> just saying. I just want to say that before I continue on. So, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm trying to be funny and everything go on. So it's true. <laughs> Like, right? You know, with people in the family of God, I mean, you don't have to like everybody. You know, like personalities and stuff. But I'm supposed to love everybody. I want, I want what's best for my brothers and sisters. You know what? I'm not in competition with anybody here. I, I love everybody. If you get blessed with a new job, I'll rejoice with you. If you get a blessing in your family, I'll rejoice with you. We are all here together as family to support each other and to love each other and to help. How wonderful and beautiful it is when brothers and sisters, they get along. Hebrews 10, 24. I'm going to wrap it up. I know I keep saying that. All right. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 24. This is the Passion Translation. It says, discover creative ways to encourage others and to motivate them toward acts of compassion. Doing beautiful works as an expression of love. This is not the time to pull away and neglect meeting together as some have formed the habit of doing. In fact, we should come together even more frequently. So you hear what he's saying? Don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Now more than ever, we need to come together. And we need to come together as one. We're not going to agree on everything. Right? right? right. We're not. Amen. But we can agree on this. Jesus. Amen. We can agree on that. And we can agree in love. Amen? We may have a difference of opinion on if Adam had a belly button. You know, did Adam have a belly button? Maybe not. Who cares, right? <laughs> Amen. All right. <laughs> I should have threw that in there. So I want to say this. I want to encourage you. Connect, reconnect, engage with Jesus. Begin to Make it a practice of worshiping God and praising Him. Why? Because God desperately needs your praise and worship? No. He's worthy of that praise. He's worthy of that worship. And it impacts you. It impacts you. It breaks chains off of you. And then also I want to challenge you with just re-engaging and reconnecting with our brothers and sisters in Christ. If you know, if there's somebody here today you don't know, Make sure you greet them before they leave today. Amen? Amen. Say, God bless you. It's good to see you. And just, just love on people. You know, the Bible says, I can chase a thousand, but two can chase ten thousand. Right? So that means we need each other. Yep. Amen? Yeah. So we have a mission from God, God, to reach Northeast Ohio. You know, it's not just about coming to church. This is not the end. It's not the end-all, be-all. We want to reach people with the love of Jesus. Amen. I got a whole other page of scripture, but I'm not going to go there. Let's just pray. Amen. Amen. So, Father God, I just thank you for these people here today. I thank you, Lord, that you have good plans for them. You have plans to prosper them and give them a hope and an expected end. Lord, you have plans and purposes. As Pastor Larry would say, 
Plans and purposes inside of plans. Plans inside of plans. Purposes inside of purposes. Lord, right now we know what these folks have need of today. And so, Father, right now, I speak life and I speak liberty over every person under the sound of my voice. I speak health. I break off right now a spirit of fear. I break off fear. I break off depression. I break off discouragement. I break off this, this feeling of hopelessness. And right now, Father, we loose the hope and the, 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 the realization of the future that we have in you, Jesus. We are not without hope as some. But we are children of God. You have a plan and a purpose for each of us. Right now, Father, I speak, Lord, to these, fam these people here, to their families, that they would just be blessed, that they would be healed, that they would find, Lord, that place and that purpose that you have for them. Jesus, in Jesus' name. So let's do the communion. pain so you could that would take my pain away you carried upon yourself all sickness and disease so that I don't have to experience sickness and disease you experienced rejection so that I would be accepted let's partake of the cup and the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 11 it says in the same way he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So you can partake of the cup. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Can you stand with me? Father, I just thank you, Lord, today for your blood, your precious blood that was shed for me on the cross. How you paid for my sin. You paid for my healing. You paid for my deliverance. You paid for everything that I need in this life. So, Father God, I thank you that today we're starting. We're going to reconnect. We're going to re-engage with you, Lord, knowing, knowing that when we do so, we're going to see things begin to move and to change in our lives. Yes, Lord, I just ask you, Father, for quick wins to encourage us. To encourage us when we do so. Help us, Lord, to love each other as you would love. And with the same love that you love. Help us, Lord, to reach out to people. Help us, Lord, not to be just consumed, not to be consumer-minded in the church, but to be mission-minded, to be love-minded. In Jesus' name, help us to connect. 
there's anybody here today you need special prayer, you just come to the front and we'll pray for you. But otherwise, you are dismissed. God bless you. We wish you an awesome Sunday. A good week. God bless you. a little bit water this afternoon. Yes, that's right.